Jai Guru, everyone. Jai Guru. Hi, welcome to Chapter 13, Part 8. I'm with Mike and Chris. How are you both? Very well. Thank you. Happy to be here. We're, we're missing Lauren. I'm, I'm missing Lauren. Lauren's presence. Yes. That was great. He's a big miss when she's not here. Um, she was supposed to do the summary of the previous episode, which she led, but I'll do it on her behalf. So previously, we talked about the section where Ram Gopal Mazumdar was talking about how he doubted how much favour he had in God's eyes. And we obviously then discussed how much favour we have in God's eyes and uh, where to put doubt in those kind of places, i.e. in the trash can. Um, and we discussed how Ram Gopal Mazumba did long, medita- long meditations over many decades and um, how Guruji was, uh, you know, interp- shock- as shocked as what we were would have been as reading that and uh, perhaps, uh, again, doubting our ability to receive the grace. But again, Thank, thankfully, Mkunda also is, like, says you don't need to, and Ram Gopal Zumda says you don't need to do that to find God. But uh, obviously, if you can, that's probably not a bad thing. <laughs> um, and then Ram Gopal Zumda talked about um, sustaining himself, um, i.e. not by bread alone, but, but by the word of God, as, um, as Guruji explains with Brana as the science. And then we talked a little bit about Babaji's message of um, how even a little bit of meditation will save you from diaspheres. So this episode, uh, we're going to start with the sentence, if you work hard, you will get there. And get to where, (laughs) you may ask. Um, We're not talking about the Himalayas here. He's talking about God realization and the implication being we must keep on keeping on, and which is a famous line in, in SRF. We must continue and persevere with our practices. We should be steady with it um, and do it faithfully. We should uh, not miss our meditations. We shouldn't give up, even though sometimes we might find that our meditations aren't being very fruitful. We like our mind plays tricks on us. And, as you say to yourself, you know, I'm not having a deep meditation, I might as well quit here. Um, but we have to keep on, ignore those, uh, push those uh, annoying doubts to the back or even get them out of your mind. Hey, Chris? Mm. Yeah, there's going to be levels to this, I guess. You know, it's the first level might be just to sit down and do anything, you know, whatever it might be, whatever your practice might be. Um, I'm probably closer to that than, you know, sitting down and making up my mind to meditate for 18 hours straight, like we saw from the sleepless saint, um, which requires a whole different sort of mental discipline. But I wonder, you know, was, was there a time for you guys that you can remember where you crossed that threshold where you made up your mind to meditate and do the practice no matter what? Like, did it happen all at once? All of a sudden, did you kind of flirt with the idea and then go away and come back to it? Because for me, I sort of more or less remember when it came to me that I made up my mind that I was going to do it, almost like brushing my teeth or having a shower, and it was that critical. Um, was there something with you guys? Like, did it did it click all of a sudden? Did you have some inspiration from somewhere? Did you read something? Or um, what, what's uh, what's your position on that? I think for me, it was gradual because. I had for a long time the opinion that the more I meditate, the better my life goes. And then all that was lacking was actually doing it. And then I slowly build up the habit of meditating twice a day and then making them longer. And um, one thing that I want to say is that I, for, for a long time, now the last two years about, I felt I had really built up a really good um, sadhana and I was very proud of it. And I was like, nothing can happen to shake this up and it's Mm -hmm. perfect forever. And now I have a, I I, I switched jobs and I have a really long commute now and I have to get up at 
six and and leave the house by like just before seven and it has become so much harder suddenly i'm like oh my god this is terrible like meditating doing like a real proper meditation in the morning has become really difficult and then i come home afterwards and i'm so tired and yeah so it's a it's a challenge i'm i'm working on but i think that's sometimes what life is right you get used to something you get some good thing going and then it goes like okay now you're on level two now now I'll try again if you yeah. can keep it up mm, yeah. interesting i've been pondering over that actually mike because i always thought um the theory is that we should be able to do our practices and manage our routine no matter what our you know circumstances may be that's the goal right but i always think that if and when i'm retired it'll be so much easier you won't have this <laughs> 7 a.m you know all this chaos that you're talking about and same for me like even though i um, i don't need to leave till 8 30 my my work is quite close i find that on the i'm still doing lower periods lesser periods of meditation in the morning than i do when i'm off work on, on the weekends so i'm thinking gosh it, why can't i get there i should i should be able to just wake up two hours earlier and yeah. not have rather than having like a okay meditation but having a good one like i could do when i'm off and i'm still um struggling with that i suppose um to the point where i'm thinking i'm uh, maybe i need to hasten my retirement just so i can <laughs> meditate but i don't think that's the point isn't it we should be able to we should be able to manage our routine especially me i mean i don't have children so i've got no real <laughs> excuse <laughs> But in, in answering Chris's question, um, I had to do it in really slow, you know, bite-sized chunks. So I remember before it was just getting through the practices and making sure that I do them every day. And it wasn't, wasn't for very long periods. I mean, I'd spend like 10 minutes on Hong Saw and five minutes on Om and then just meditate and finish, you know, in half an hour. And then I just gradually every every year i gradually increased it um and now it's um you know however however long my schedule allows you know anything from an hour to, to two or three hours if um, if it's the weekend so yeah it was a gradual gradual thing for me but um i think it's still a work in work in progress um i think as it is for all of us whether you're a beginner or you're nearer to the uh advanced Ram Gopal Mazumdar mode of, uh, <laughs> of the spiritual path. Um, so Guruji is enthralled by the pros prospect of getting there and uh, he asks him for further, more enlightening words. And this is um, a bit of a, you have to scratch your head a little bit because the previous uh, enlightening words were a few um, sentences or paragraphs ago where he said, um, you know, Ram Gopal Mazumdar said, hitch your, you know, hitch yourself to the star of unqualified divine attainment. So from there, he's gone to here um, so as the next set of enlightening words, but, um, or inspiring words. But now he talks, um, Ram Gopal Mazumdar from there goes to the story of Mahavtar Babaji. And um, obviously he's going to relate this story in chapter 33, i.e. Babaji's promise to never leave his physical form. And it must have been quite a telling because it would appear he took three hours or so to tell this story. My, um, in, in calculating that, they met midday that day. They got mm -hmm. to the house, say, you know, within a couple of hours, probably less than that. So, and then they spent four hours to meditate. That takes them till dinner time, like 6 p.m. And then they had food and dinner, you'd expect, you know, 8 p.m. maybe, should be even less than that. So it was at least a three or four hour discussion, because he says it was midnight when he opened his, you know, when, when they um, finished this section. So um, that's a, you know, the, the section in chapter 33, if you were to tell it to someone, even in full detail, you probably wouldn't spend more than 20 minutes. So one wonders what, Ram Gopal Mazumdar would have been telling young Mukunda for three or four hours. Um, obviously, Guruji only told us maybe a little section of it, 
or maybe there was periods of like deep meditation interspersed like we have when we're doing our Gita readings or second coming of Christ readings or lessons reading study in the SRF format who knows um, but uh, it's it's quite cool that um, that Ram Razumda is not just telling this story he's he's responding to Mukunda's request for further enlightening words which would imply that this Babaji story is not just a fantastic tale to or inspire you but it's actually um, enlightening these words um, there's there's folklore in India that um, like the Ram Gatha for example they say if you hear the Rama um, even hearing it is an enlightening experience so you're privileged and blessed and have a lot of grace just to be in the in the presence of a master who's telling the Ramayan. So in a similar way, Ram Gopal Mazumdar is telling this Babaji story and it is actually an enlightening experience for Mukunda and likewise, probably for us as well. Um, so that is how much um, reverent, with how much reverence we should probably read chapter 33 because um, that, you know, this is how Ram Gopal Mazumdar has described it here and how um, Mukunda has asked for it essentially. So, um, yeah, so, uh, Chris, oh, no, Mike. Yeah, I, I always thought that when you go into, into those states, that time flies because you are so happy and, and you don't want to come back. So I don't think you're in a rush to come back to this old shed in the middle of nowhere. You're probably really happy up there and communing and, and, like you said, Priyan, he might not tell the whole story. Maybe they were communing with other saints at this time. But I can see why three hours would just just go by like a flash, literally. Yeah, it's it's a good um, good point and to the word that you use there, Mike, flash. It might actually have something directly to do with what happens next, you know, in the next sentence. Quite literally. So the enlight enlightening words, um, the amount of time maybe that they spent maybe meditating on these concepts and thoughts that might have been brought up in that time. And then what happened next happens next in terms of these flashes of lightning. So it's um maybe sh shows us that the more the better company we keep, the more tilt that we might have into more enlightening states. One is reminded of the cosmic chant, what lightning flash glimmers in thy face, mother, seeing thee I am thrilled through and through. And that is a good um, chant for what he's about to experience, because it says that, um, so at midnight, Ram Gopal Mazumdar finished the story, um, and it must have moved him as well. So it wasn't just enlightening to hear the story, it was apparently enlightening to tell it as well. Um, so he says, um, Mukunda lay down on his blankets and then he closed his eyes and then he saw flashes of lightning and a space within him was as if it was a chamber of molten light. And then he says he opened his eyes and he experienced the same radiance um, and he further describes it and he says the room became part of an infinite vault and he was beholding it with his interior vision which is quite cool um, and we <laughs> i'm sure not all of us are blessed enough to uh, experience this light but um sister gyana mother's got a lovely quote about this but uh, before we do mike so this lightning flash that he sees there, still not cosmic consciousness, but it must have been some really high experience, probably went with a really high, high state of consciousness as well, very desirable. Um, but when you are the God seeker, you get those things and you're still not satisfied. You want to keep going, so feel somebody. Mm. 
also you may be dismayed to read about all this um, mysticism and mystical experiences here and in the lessons um, which you know describe similar things about the spiritual life um, and in the Bhagavad Gita of course God talks about Arjuna and second coming of Christ you know um, so there's, there's references you know Christ also makes these references and behold my body you know was full of light um, so Gyanamata, but we may be dismayed, as I say, but we shouldn't be dismayed. Um, and Gyanamata has got quite a nice um, section in her book, Only Love. Mike, do you want to read it out? It's a letter to his her Guruji, our master. My blessed master, I want to tell you why I asked that favor this morning. I never see the light of the spiritual light perfectly, that is. If I close my eyes when sitting in the sunshine, Quickly, I see the circle of gold and the beautiful blue center, but not the star. I only see the star in the darkness, and then I do not see the colored circles. You may remember that the day you left for your trip, you touched me between the eyebrows just before um, a, um, you went down to the car, thinking intently of you. I closed my eyes and there was the light, all the parts together and in place, small but perfect. It was the very first time I had seen the light as a whole. Gyanamat. So we have to persevere. Gyanamat, of course, was one of Guruji's most advanced disciples and uh, I recommend her book, Only Love, which um, is a beautiful rendering of her devotion and just lovely chronicle of her spiritual experiences and pursuits um, and her yearning which is really nice um, but um, there are as as Gyana Mata described there's many um, degrees of the perception of the spiritual eye Mike it's also a reminder that getting spiritual experiences is not just our effort but also the grace of God and the great of grace of our Guru. And so she asked Guru Deva to have those experiences in the same way we ask him or our Guru to have them, rather than feeling there's two sides to it, right? Like Ram Gopal says, you have to work hard, you will get there. And the other side is the, the grace of the Guru. Mm. Mm. Indeed. So the... Uh, Gopal, Ram Gopal Mazumdar um, saw Mukunda probably in a bit of a state <laughs> and he said why don't you go to sleep and Mukunda responded saying how can I when lightning is blazing around me whether my eyes are open or closed and then, and then Ram Gopal Mazumdar says you are blessed essentially to have this experience um, these radiations, these lights are not easily seen. So uh, there are, as we said, degrees of perception of the spiritual eye. So we may see, we may have little glimpses of it here and there, but we may not see the complete, um, you know, opal blue with golden rings surrounded by white blazing light and a five-pointed star in the middle. But we may see other things, um, and there's a very lovely section in um, chapter 6, verse 13 of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Chris, do you like to start us off? The presence of a concentration of the light of life force in the eyes is evidenced by the fact that even a gentle pressure on the eyeballs, by the fingers pressing gently and rotating over the eyelids, of the closed eyes will cause the emission of light in the darkness of the closed eyes. Many think that this pressure induced light is just physical. This is not the case. This light seen only by the con consciousness is not grossly physical. It is rather a semi-physical and semi-spiritual manifestation of the life energy that builds, guides and enlivens all the bodily tissues. 
seeing the inner light by yoga concentration methods of fixing the gaze, attention, and devotion instead of by physical pressure refines this semi-spiritual manifestation, changing it to the finer vibratory rates of its pure spiritual nature. Hence, the quality of the semi-spiritual light seen by gently pressing the eyes is at hand and is enhanced with an increase in the depth of the devotee's meditation. I really, it's really cool to read this because I remember when, when I was practicing one of the techniques um, and I was pressing my eye and I, I experienced this exact thing, you know, shoot, shoots of uh, light and I thought, oh gosh, I must be doing this wrong and causing my brain to manufacture, <laughs> manufacture light. So it's um, quite cool that um, it's not physical, Guruji is describing. So if, uh, you know, you get these um, shoots of light, you touch your eyes in this way or point them towards the third eye, um, then don't be... Don't think that is a physical. You're again. You're blessed to um, have even this little experience because it's uh, it's uh, it is you know it is spiritual. It's part of the astral body light that's coming out. I was going to say I'll say I'll say I'll say. <laughs> so should I say I'll say, but uh, uh, um, because it is semi spiritual. I, I was the same in the same boat as you, Priyank. I, had the experiences many times just rubbing my eyes when I'm tired, even um, and thinking the same thing. But if it is semi spiritual, then there is a intimate relationship. Maybe it's not best to share too too much. But um, interestingly, I always would see like a matrix grid, literally a matrix grid that you would see in you know in a 1990s computer mock up of of reality. Um, and I always wondered like, wow, that's a pretty cool. Uh, projection of light coming from the eyes you know that's i wonder how that's structured in the in the back of the iris or something you know was, i was always thinking how that works because it was always it's always the same thing so yeah maybe all these things manifest differently for people there you go people there's a uh, hidden in the very depths of god talks with Arjuna. you know there's little little you know nuggets gold nuggets light nuggets that you can uh, you can um lean upon especially if you're experience, experiencing certain things and dismissing it like uh, Chris and I were but uh, you shouldn't dismiss it um, and same with um, the warm vibration sounds you know they're varying degrees and if you hear certain things and you think oh that's just you know my circulation and all that kind of stuff you should uh, just read the lessons and um, go back to uh, what it says about that um, and don't dismiss dismiss uh, experiences essentially. So the last thing that the Ram Gopal Mazumda says in this line is that the saint added, well, the Ram Gopal Mazumda added a few words of affection, which we're not uh, privy to. <laughs> we can guess, I'm sure, guess what they were, because um, he's essentially, um, you know, reassuring Makunda of his spiritual wealth as it were in this section so the dawn has night is flowing and dawn has come <laughs> and Makunda has awoken <laughs> and um, this is obviously Mike laughing because this is a, a very famous chant in the Sarif um, so Ram Kapoor gave, gave him rock candies um, and uh, we mentioned in the previous episode what those kind of things were and said that he must depart, <laughs> which is, uh, at, you know, at 6 a.m. probably, uh, that around, around about that time. Um, and it's quite an abrupt um, invitation to leave. <laughs> but remember, we have, um, remember I told you about the whole thing about manners and you know, this not being such a cause of offence uh, in, in India. And this would have been the case for Makunda as well, because he didn't say, oh, I was flabbergasted by such man. He didn't, he didn't say that was any such thing. He just took it on the chin. But 
and another point is that um, very, very early starts, um, it's just like, it's just a common theme that uh, everyone just accepts in India. Um, it's like part of their DNA. They just don't think it's uh, a problem to rise before the sun has, you know, just come up and you're out the door before the sun has come up because, uh, um, you know, like 85% of the labor force is like in India is like agriculture and you have to start the very earliest opportunity. You know, as soon as the daylight breaks, you have to be, you know, axe, you know, shovel in hand, um, ready to do your work. So yeah, so it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have felt early for Mukunda essentially. And Mukunda said he felt reluctance to say bye. And it's very sweet. It says he had tears coursed down his cheeks. And it must've been quite a moving pilgrimage that he's been upon for, for these tears to just flow because it's only been, he's been with Ram Gopal Mazumdar for what, less than a day. <laughs> Two, two thirds of a day and he's already um, developed such a lovely relationship with him and he says um, maybe it was because um, well, it could it could have been that um, Mukunda is very um, in touch with Divine Mother isn't he and his affection he gives his affection very easily as Divine Mother would so um, you can imagine Divine Mother crying in this way and Mukunda exemplifies her so he's doing the same thing that's just my conjecture mike oh no i was just checking something because you said in, at this time it was probably 85 percent of indians working in agriculture i checked now it's only 17 percent oh, wow. so, times have changed quite a bit yeah. <laughs> amazing yeah. yeah amazing um so What's next? Um, he says Rangopal Mazumdar senses, um, you know, Mukunda's uh, affection, and he says, "I won't," and it moves him. It must have moved him because maybe he wasn't willing to do what he's about to do until he saw this or experienced this love from Mukunda. He says, "I won't let you go empty-handed," and he spoke to him tenderly again. He says, "I'll do something for you," mm -hmm. and says he smiled and looked at him and Bukunda became immobile as though rooted to the ground and then he felt peace that was emanating from the saint and it was flooding his being. It's so lovely that, I don't know if you guys ever um, experienced that, maybe it's just the Indian way, but oftentimes when I was with SRF monks or with like devotees who are really serious devotees and you go to their homes the the whole way they treat you is so amazing and I feel like he did a lot for Mukunda already at this point but then he feels that he has to do one more thing for him because he came all this way out so he gives him this amazing gift now so I find I find that incredible how hospitable he is mm, indeed and this feeling that he's um, experiencing um, it was actually it was affected only by a smile and a look from Ram Gopal Mazumdar and you'll note before um, it's always been like a touch to the heart when Mukunda experiences like something something serious um, with Master Mahashai for example or um, in the next chapter um, when um, he has the experience in cosmic consciousness, Sri Yukdesha, I think, taps his, taps his heart. Um, and Lahiri Mahashaya does something similar for his devotees when he gives them a bit of a thud um, in the chest. So for here, Ram Gopal Mazumdar just looked at him, which is quite cool. But obviously, this may be a, just, you know, a vibration of peace um, is obviously not the same as uh, an experience in cosmic consciousness. So maybe that uh, that greater, such a great um, impact needs a physical uh, knock or a blow to uh, you know get you out of the physical into the astral and cosmic um, realms. Um, and it does. It sounds like a like a just a mini, like maybe ten percent of a samadhi, doesn't it? 
um, and it's uh, also like a precursor to the real thing that he's going to experience in the next uh, chapter and we're going to talk about in the next in the coming episodes so it's quite nice and he says um, with this piece he was instantly healed of a back pain that had been troubling him intermittently for many many years and this is quite comforting because I too have such similar back pains I know Mike you do too so it seems we're not in um, we're not in bad company here <laughs> Mukunda I don't have it anymore but I used to yeah Mukunda also experiences or had experienced these things so uh, all of us who struggle with our backs so we can you know we all have our individual karma to burn <laughs> I hope we one day we can be healed as Mike has been and uh, Mukunda was as well so then he felt Mukunda says he felt renewed and he was felt as if he was bathed in a sea of luminous joy his tears were essentially gone and he didn't weep anymore and he touched Ram Gopal Mazumdar's feet which is of course the custom uh, which is like a very traditional sign of showing your respect and reverence but there's also a um, hidden element to this because um, you also receive a blessing when you do that and the it's treated with um, such reverence that uh, the blessing has to come whether or not the person who's the blessings coming from knows it or not <laughs> so that they um there's, they really dramatize this in indian cinema there's this one um one very long film i think it may have been kabhi kushi kabhi Kham or one of those um, karan johar films um where um you know families are estranged for many years and um the the daughter-in-law meets the the father-in-law but they don't he doesn't know who she is but she knows him and um she um she wants to receive his blessings right but she doesn't want to reveal who she is because they've had this whole family trouble so she pretends to drop something near his feet and just touches his feet and then takes the takes the blessing so they, it's a very uh, beautiful tradition and uh, that film it describes it very well it's quite moving and uh, comical at the same time but, it, but obviously Ram Gopal Mazumdar would have uh, would have known would have willingly granted the blessing so not only had he received the little spark of uh, samadhi that he also uh, vacated with a tangible blessing um, after touching Ram Gopal Mazumdar's feet so after that, he entered the jungle and made his way through the tropical tangle and over the many paddy fields. What's a paddy field again, Chris? Rice fields. Yes. Rice fields. Aren't paddies? For... Aren't Irish people known as paddies? <laughs> for the for the reason of Patrick. Yeah, there you go. Um, Patrick, yes, yeah, slightly different. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just know from football. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so Mukunda then reached the shrine of Tarakeshwar to undo what he had not done uh, in the previous uh, section of this of this um, chapter. So he goes to the pilgrimage spot again to the famous shrine. The second time he goes there, and this time he fully prostrates himself before the altar. And he makes sure he does it. And um, this is a, I don't know if you, do you guys know what a full prostration is versus a, just a prostration, Mike? So when you lay flat on the ground. Yeah, so. there's also more to it though. Okay. Anyway, you can finish what you were going to say first. No, I mean, I, my point was more that he made such a big deal out of this, even though he's Yogananda. But I think it's also like for us a lesson when we see a statue of a deity or of God or something to respect that because it respects God himself, shows our devotion and also shows respect for other people who 
worship God this way kind of so I think it's a very important thing um, metaphysically to do indeed so the full prostration is um, uh, so you so you lie fully flat as Mike said your arms should be fully outstretched in front of you and this is you face flat on the ground your forehead touches the soil <clears throat> and then you take uh, each temple touches it and then you mm. go back so and your the whole body is completely straight it's almost like an asana your whole body is completely straight um and usually when you do a prostration you're not wearing any footwear so your big toes are touching your hands are touching so it's like a quite an energetic um uh experience actually um so if you ever if you're ever in uh, in the physical presence of a spiritual master or even a very significant place of pilgrimage then this is um, remember that yeah. this is the uh, custom <laughs> so then he says that when he did this the round stone enlarged before his inner vision until mm. it became the cosmic spheres <laughs> ring within ring zone after zone all dowered with divinity What a fantastic uh, vision and what a great um, kind of example we have for what we should endeavor to experience if we are in the proximity of an energized space such as a linga, um, such as, such as Tarakeshwar. Um, and there's many, many powerful linga shrines in, um, in India. Um, the the mo more famous ones are called... Uh, Jyotir lingas, which is uh, which are basically, um, I'll put a wiki link to it, but they're the most significant ones. There's some history behind it. Um, Mike, make me want to go there now. Next time I'll go to Kolkata to see Guruji's home. I'll I'll try to also go to Tarakeshwar and see that shrine because it was such a big deal in this chapter here. Mm. So, mm. and if you go to um, Varanasi or Kashi, and you go see um, the. You know, if you happen to go on Guru Puja Day and you get to see this, the linga that is in Lahiri Mahashaya's house, then uh, you'll obviously also have that similar example as to what you should meditate, what you should perhaps visualize. Um, but also, um, if you're in Kashi, then you should go to the Kashi Vishwanath temple, um, which is, as I described, one of the most significant Jyotri Lingas in, in India or in the world. So uh, it's a very energized space that you can go to, which is all very close to Lahiri Mahashaya's house. And no doubt he would have uh, gone there many times as well, being such a significant temple in that, uh, in that part of India. So yeah, very lovely. Um, and I, this is always very uh, moving for me because um, I, I always experience um, and experience the linga. It's not often; it's very underwhelming to see the linga because um, some of them are very great and they're overwhelming because they're perfect geometrical designs, and you know you won't see any flaw in them. So it's very like you know it's jarring to see it. Um, and there's also, there's always, there's always flowers and things like that. So it's like you're blown away. But the more significant ones um, are actually natural, natural formations. So they actually have come out of the ground of their own accord. And then because of the energy, and they've established that as a, um, as a temple. And the linga was the rock that had come out of the ground. And Kedarnath is probably... Um, one of the most significant ones in India as well, in North India, in the Himalayas. Um, I actually did a video on that. Um, I'll put a link to it as well, a little mm -hmm. snapshot. So, yeah, so that's another temple where the linga has just come, has risen out of the ground. So we've got no idea how old it is, um, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years old. Um, but obviously the culture and the history of India is incalculable. In that respect so um yeah so it's always nice to no it is very nice for me to read this because now i've got some 
um, visualization, as it were, to add to my experience of the linga or of the temples that have a linga. There you go. You can you can use that too. And I, I read this. Obviously, I read the autobiography so many times, but it's only now that um, I'm fully grasping this uh, this section, which is quite powerful. So yeah, the moral of the story is we make mistakes, all of us do, but let us always try to undo them. <laughs> go back, uh, not only repeat the same, never to repeat the same mistake, but actually go back and uh, correct our wrongs, just as uh, Makunda has done here. So control Z is a good, <laughs> motto, good motto for life. <laughs> um, uh, computer science yeah. joke. Um, yes, if mistake, <laughs> control Z. Yeah. Uh, oh, Mike, you said Z. Oh, you've <laughs> gone down. You've gone down in my estimations. What's we're, we're, interna here? we're international, yeah. We're like <laughs> all different places. <laughs> <laughs> True. Okay, so um, he, sa he said now he happily trained an hour later for Calcutta and his travels ended not in the lofty mountains, but in the Himalayan presence of Suryukteshwar. Mm -hmm. And it's a very wonderful description of Suryukteshwar to describe him as a uh, Himalayan presence, isn't it? More so him than probably any, any of our gurus, <laughs> including Christ and uh, Krishna, because uh, you can just imagine Himalayas in, is in... Um, not just in the stature of Sri uh, Yukteswar, um, but also in his uh, fathom, fath fathomable, fathomless gaze as he looks at you and assesses you and blesses you, perhaps. <laughs> and this pretty much ends our chapter. Um, very lovely chapter. Uh, lots of fantastic takeaways from me, uh, not least just that last section where I can now know how to visualize a what visualization meditation to do when approaching a linga but uh, it was really a lovely lovely description of how to make um, arduous journeys how to make them easy and how to make it so God helps us in overcoming those journeys um, or we can actually cause a hindrance to ourselves and make it harder if we do incorrect things as uh, Mukunda did in, uh, you know, whilst he embarked, both in terms of uh, getting the permission from <laughs> through Deshwar and also the um, Darakeshwar Shrine episode. Um, and it was also a fantastic um, exposition on the life and the ways, the ways of Ram Gopal Masundar and his just fantastic cocktail of mysticism and austere uh, mentality and devotion, of course, because he like he really thinks of himself as nothing, doesn't he? Um, which is uh, which is really beautiful to to read because he's obviously such a towering spiritual figure to have the experiences that he's had, and you know he's the one that relates the whole. He was there for the story with Babaji, right? So you can imagine how much grace. He must be living in to have had that experience with Babaji and Mataji, which we'll cover in chapter 33. And um, the picture, his picture was very beautiful. So some autobiographies don't have that picture, but I urge you to find a newer edition. Um, the, I know the large print, for example, definitely has it. Um, I just checked it. My sister-in-law has one. Um, and yeah, the last section um, is, I think, just as important where we have to undo our mistakes and we should not harbour any feelings of guilt and unworthiness in that respect um, when we do make mistakes because to err is human. Yeah, well said. It, it, it's a very adventurous chapter, isn't it? You know, we started out by reading the kind of ominous error let's say that Rakunda was making by leaving his master and there was a bit of a betrayal in the air where his consciousness he betrayed his own consciousness you know and then it kind of unfolded and unfolded and it ended in this beautiful place of course but we went around 
along with that journey very very nicely and my favorite line one one of my favorite lines in 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 the book um was the what one does not trouble to find within will not be discovered by transporting the body hither and yon that sort of tells me that summarizes that chapter for me you know we'll, we'll go on these wild adventures for what you know we're, we're we're kind of chasing those that well that without that we actually should be seeking within um and uh yeah it's it's really what uh, ram kapal pushes on mukunda and tries to impress on mukunda and stop seeking out the himalayas so yeah really really beautiful chapter quite a fun chapter um and loved every minute of looking back over it in more detail and you you could say it was a mistake the whole thing but also it wasn't because he had to make this journey to get rid of this desire of finding a guru in the himalayas so he did the right thing he was checking was my desire worthwhile and he felt it was and so even though it was a bit of a, um i think don't think he really got permission from his guru but he he left because this was an overwhelming wish that he had and now he came back maybe i don't know how long it took a week later two weeks later but he has resolved that within him and just having accomplished that is worth the trip and worth everything and he made this amazing connection with the saint who in the end even healed his back and gave him some extra wisdom and the story that he will share later on so i i think this is positive all around the way he came back mm. indeed i always always in my mind when i re re reflecting on mukunda's you know teen years teenage years you may have been 18 or 19 at the time of this experience but i always think a his 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 time with the master mahashai and then b his time with ram gopal mazumdar in my mind they're like with the same person <laughs> So I can't usually when I'm reflect when I'm reflecting I can't remember if it was Martin Rasha or Ram Gopal Mazumdar because they're both such eminent um, eminent sages aren't they? But uh, to help the distinction, Ram Gopal Mazumdar is most certainly within our lineage of uh, direct lineage of um, guru disciple relationship, and Master Mahasha obviously belongs to um, the the order of uh, Ram, Ram Krishna Paramahansa so that would you might describe as an adjacent <laughs> parallel lineage that goes up so that's how I like to um, contrast the two anyway so that ends that chapter thank you very much Mike and Chris for, for that um, next episode we are obviously starting the very probably one of the top three most important chapters of the book which is an experience in co cosmic consciousness. And uh, we'll just start next episode with our expectations of the whole chapter. Um, but the first section we'll cover is when Mukunda returns to the ashram um, and how forgiving Sri Yukteswar is and by, you know, his, his kind of uh, emphasizing how forgiving Divine Mother is as well. And there's a very beautiful, loving moment between the two of them, which we'll delve into more next week. So thank you very much, listeners and viewers. We shall see you next time. Hopefully Lauren will be with us again. Jai Guru. Jai Guru.